Good morning to people that are joining us. We're going to take a couple of minutes here and let other people enter the room. Um, and then I will give a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Jeremy Chase Israel and I work for NICLA. I'm the member relations manager. Um, so yep, yeah, we're just going to give it a couple minutes and then we will start. With the box back here, they can see with that box, and they can see the. You see it like this, so it's on the side, so they'll see this, and then they they see you also here. So they saw your arm, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're just going to give it another minute, let a couple more people join us, and then we will start. Who do we have now, do you know? Can't tell. Um, might be able to tell you. That's okay. Good morning, good afternoon to those of us who are joining from different time zones. Um, today we are very privileged to have with us um, Al Pooley. Um, Al, you'll be able to introduce yourself in a second here from the Native American Fatherhood and Families Association. The presentation that we're going to be putting on today is titled Addressing Family Violence and Abuse. Um, the presentation will define the devastating problems explore contributing factors and discuss culturally sensitive ways in which to help victims and abusers overcome the cycle of abuse and violence, as well as the disturbing effects it causes in the lives of families and communities. Um, a little bit about the presenter. Um, Al Pooley is born to the Hopi and Navajo Native American cultures. He grew up close to both cultures in the reservation where the love of a father taught him outstanding life lessons. He holds a Master of Social Work and a Master of Public Administration, has an extensive experience as a marriage and family counselor. In 2002, Mr. Pooley founded the Native American Fatherhood and Families Association with the purpose of strengthening and keeping families together. Um, so yeah, I'm very honored to have Al here as well and to have this great presentation. So Al, if you want to take it away and, and add on to anything and, and start when you feel like it. Sure. Well, thank you and good morning to everyone. I don't know if, if anybody knows who I am, but let me give you a little overview of who we are. I started the Native American Fatherhood and Family Association back in 2002. We started with one father and today we work with over 240 tribes throughout North America. So we're very pleased with our, with our, with our work. We have, a, we have a staff of about 12 people with us here in Arizona and we have about, oh gee, several hundred, eight or 900 trained facilitators throughout the country that teach our material. And I don't know. If, I don't know if anybody is joining us that that's a facilitator, but but I'd like to say hello to you. I'm going to periodically drink. My my throat gets dry periodically, so I hope you don't mind me drinking something here real quickly. Before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to share with you our approach in working with people first. First of all, we we tell our facilitators this: if you're going to work with people knowledge rarely changes people. You can, you can tell a person, for example, who is, who is using a, drugs or alcohol, you can tell them they shouldn't drink, the harms and danger effects of alcohol and drugs, and they'll say things like, I know, I know. People do know what they have to do, what they should not be doing. Knowledge rarely changes people. You have to make them feel, as we tell our facilitators, 
you must make them feel. Because if, because, but unfortunately, most curriculum out there that Native American people use or anybody, it's all knowledge based. And we say, if you're gonna work with our people, work with Native people, one of the first things you must do as a, as a worker, you must truly love the people whom you serve. And I know that goes contradiction against, against many times some academic approaches of working with people. What we say, if you work with our Native people, you must first of all truly love them because now you have the best interests in mind and they will begin to listen to you. The other thing that our program does, we say that our, our business is to strengthen families and to keep families together. That's the whole essence of our program. So we get into addressing family violence or suicide, whatever we teach. It's all about strengthening families or keeping families together. The other thing we work on, we have basically three pillars in our program. One of them, first of all, is strengthening someone's self-worth. People really got to see the value of themselves and see their own self-worth. Why we do that? Because most major decisions you make in your life has a direct correlation with your self-worth. So that's really important, the value, how you value yourself. And unfortunately, one of the ways that happens is that how, how people treat you, how have you been treated by your family, most of all, by friends, by community, that has a direct impact on your self-worth. The other thing that we have, we work with, the other pillar we work on is identity, trying to get a strong identity because identity can change throughout life. For an example, maybe you go into a teenage years, you have one, you, 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 you may see yourself one way, or maybe you go into prison, you see yourself a different way. And when you, and, and so different things happen to you, but we want you to get a true identity of who you really are. And so we work on that too, because that's important in, 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 in changing your life. The other thing then, the third pillar we work on is bringing purpose to someone's life. So what is the purpose of your life? What is the purpose of being a father or a mother or being a neighbor or being a brother or sister? We try to bring purpose. Let me give you an example why that's so important. I had a friend of mine that went to college. He was in college for over 10 years and he never got a degree. He just went to school because he wanted to go to school. And well, once he brought purpose to himself, he actually got married. His wife had him make sure that you know went to, you've been going to school long enough now let's get in and get out when you have purpose to your life you get point you get, you get from point a to point b very very quickly and so we, we work with families or individuals we work on their self-worth we work on their identity and we work on bringing purpose to their life so what i'm going to be telling you today is more about how do we address family violence so, um, and I don't know if you have, will have me given an opportunity to ask any questions or not, but I hope you can. Oh, I went too far. How do I go back? I'm not a techie guy, so. I... Okay. Remember self-worth. Okay, one of the things we do is this. We say, we work, we work with Native people. And we say, Native people, where do you come from? They may say, well, I come from Montana or I come from New Mexico. Yeah, that's where you, maybe you were born and raised, but where do you really come from? We say, let us help you out. And you tell me if I'm right or wrong. We say, let me tell you where you really, really come from. You're a native person. You come from greatness. You come from a great heritage. You come from a great history. You come from a great culture. You come from a great people, a great family. We've gone on a whole list of things. And we say, you know what? And I say, am I correct? And they say, yes, you do come from greatness. So we say that you must understand something. If you come from greatness, it is your job to return back to where you came from, to becoming a great person again, and to lead your family back to becoming a great person again. Along that same line, we talk about their identity. We say things like, um, right. we say things like, uh, back to greatness. We tell them, if you wanna go back to greatness, there's some things you must learn first. That is, you must allow goodness into your life because goodness comes before greatness. 
you got to become a good man or a good woman, okay? If goodness is not present, you cannot share it or give it. You can't give something you don't have. So we want our clients to become good people. You must learn, we tell them, don't, don't stand on your looks, don't stand on your education or your, or your, or your whatever you are standing on, education, your looks, your money, your status. We want you to stand on your own goodness. We want you to become a good, decent, honorable, courageous individual. Why? Because then you can go any place in this world and function very properly, very effectively, whether it's with one group or another group. You, you become, you stand on your own goodness. The other thing we work with the families on, people, is that we're trying to strengthen their identity. And we, uh, one of them is this. We ask them, where do you, we ask, what's the mother, what's your mother's name? Let me say my mother's name was Mary, for an example. And we say, one of the things you need to understand is that whether your mother gave you up for adoption or not, or whether she was the best mother in the world, when she was carrying you, your mother intended you to be successful. Your mother did not say, I hope, when, when she was carrying you, your mother did not say, I hope you become a loser. I hope you become a failure. No, she didn't say that. She carried you with the expectation that you would be successful. So we say, you are here, you are chosen to succeed in life. So we try to work with them on their identity. You are chosen to be successful. Now, not only your mother said that, but your family, your forefathers, they suffered and sacrificed for you to be successful. And we go through a process with them, where they really begin to understand one of their functions here on earth is to be successful. Then we ask them a question like this. Have you ever made a mistake in your life? I work with a lot of people who've been in prison, a lot of people, a lot of felons. And I say, I ask them always, have you made a mistake in your life? And they always say, yes, of course I have. We all have made mistakes. No one's perfect. So we say, listen, you must understand one true principle of life, and that is this. You are worth more than the worst mistake you ever, ever made in your life, and that is the truth. So we want them to understand that they are worth more than any mistake they've ever made in their life, okay? They gotta learn to forgive themselves and forgive other people. Why? Because that's part of the healing process. Then mm. the fourth thing we talk about with them is this. We say some people pray for a miracle. They pray for something to happen. I say, you know what? Miracles do happen, but you know what? The biggest miracle is you because there's never been a person like you ever, ever, ever and there'll never be a person like you ever, ever, ever again. You are, you are one of a kind. You are unique. You're priceless. And you're precious, precious, precious. My job is to help you understand it. Not just know it. Not just know the words, but really understand your own value. Now let's get back to miracles, I tell them. You are, the, you are a miracle. And I say, just play along with me. There's a key to your heart. I can help you find it. I really can help you find it, but I can't turn it. I can't turn it. Once you find it, you have to turn it. When you begin to turn your turn that key to your heart, the, the whole uh, another whole world just opens up. You can begin to see things more clearly. You're no longer lost. You can see things very, very clearly, particularly your potential. So we say this, but this, and so we say, you are here to succeed. You are here to do these things. And we say, now, listen, there's three things you must learn in life. There was three things you must learn in life. Number one is this. You must learn the importance of keeping your promises. That's critical. And you start by keeping the promises you have made to your spouse or to your partner. And the promises you've made to your family, to your children. We must, because I'm saying that is real Native American, keeping promises. So we're working with our identity. That's who you are. Keep promises. Number two, to keep laws. To keep laws. Even the universe has laws. You know, the roads, the, I mean, even you can driving a car, you must keep the laws. Or are you going to go into an accident, have an accident or cause a major injury? So there's laws, even the, even the laws of mathematics, laws of chemistry. So you must keep laws, the laws of the land. And we teach them the other thing you must do is keep rules to be your friend 
I got to keep rules. You got to keep rules. And I can't cheat you. I can't lie to you. I can't steal to you. And the list goes on and on. So we teach our fathers and mothers the importance of keeping promises, rules, and laws. And when we said, when you keep promises, rules, and laws, this is what the outcome is. You will grow, you will progress, and you will live and flourish in life. So it all depends upon you. And I say, we're teaching you Native American 101. This is our real method of working with our people. So we say, those are the things. So that's kind of, I'm just laying the foundation before I actually get into addressing family violence. <clears throat> Now this is a, an alert. We say as an alert, as a result of family violence and addiction, our great native nations are quickly becoming cultures of rejection. That is so true. When we get involved in family violence and addictions, we are actually putting our people through, a, our children particularly, through a culture of rejection. And that has devastating impact on our culture and our lives of our people. Now, oops, oh, I'm backing up here. Okay, we say, what is family violence? This is kind of, a, the title is not really on target, but unfortunately, unfortunately, child or elderly abuse are often considered separate, separate issues by professionals. We don't look at that that way. Children, children affected by violence in the home, either as a victim or a witness are negatively impacted. And this can be considered a form of emotional child abuse, whether you are a witness or whether you are actually affected by uh, the violence itself. Both are very harmful. <clears throat> Let's talk about family violence for a minute. Family violence, we try to teach our fathers and mothers this, cheats and robs yourself and loved ones. He just doesn't cheat yourself, but your loved ones, you rob them too. Family violence leads others to feel left out. I don't really belong. I don't really have a place. They begin to feel that way. And also this, it points loved ones in a wrong direction and it points us in the wrong direction if we're the person that's being, if, if we're the violent one. Family violence creates stress and pressures for the whole family, not just the spouses, but for the whole family, extended family it does too. Family violence can have a long-term harmful effect on the child and on the family. People carry that on for years. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few more minutes. Family violence is destructive to the body, mind, and spirit to children, adolescents, and adults. It affects your body, mind, and spirit. In other words, it affects you as a whole. It affects your whole soul as a person. Oh. Oh, shoot. I'm not good at this, people. You can see. Okay. Now, this is how NAFA defines domestic or family violence. We call it, it is true identity theft. And simply put plainly, identity theft is a crime. Okay. It really affects like I said, is it just true identity theft? From our, that's how we teach it. And it usually starts this way. It starts by just criticizing you. And many times we say this, we, we begin to criticize people and we say, oh, I'm just joking or I'm just teasing, but the damage has already been there. And you look at a newlywed couple many times too. That's how it starts, criticizing you. You, 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 you eat too much, you walk too slow, can't you cook, whatever, whatever, whatever. Your hair doesn't look right. Your makeup's not on right. You laugh too loud. And then it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, you're really making them feel you're actually, you're not just trying to create a new identity to those persons. Reckless words and, and actions destroy self-worth and people become lost. What, why, how do people become lost? People always ask that question. The how people become lost how we teach them is this way, is by lying. When you lie to people or when you deceive people, they become lost. Let me give an example. What if you lived in a world where everybody, everybody lied to you? Everybody. You'd become lost so quickly. You couldn't trust anybody. But what if your spouse, your parents are lying to you continuously? 
you begin to get lost. Where do I fit in? Who do I believe? Who do I trust? So we look at lost as you've been lied to. We'll talk about that a little more too in a few more minutes. Okay. Domestic violence, it's a form of stealing someone's identity, which robs there is a, you know, someone's identity, which robs others of happiness and their potential. When people lie to you all the time, it robs your happiness. It really does. And it robs their potential. Personal identity deserves to be protected. We want you to really begin to refine what you want, what how do you how do you what do you consider to be happy? You know, in the in the Constitution of the United States, we talk about we are given rights of, of um, freedom. Okay, one of the things we have is this: is the pursuit of happiness. It's happiness is something we have to pursue. It's not just given to us because because we have moments where we can be very very sad. And so when you're through, through, through domestic violence, personal identity deserves, your personal identity deserves to be protected. First, understand you are a victim. Maybe you are the victim. And many times people, victims begin to feel like they're the cause of all these problems. But most of the time, it's the perpetrator, as you know, that's, that's causing these things. So in other words, I'll, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself. Often it will take years to restore your confidence. When someone is constantly cutting you down, making fun of you, criticizing you, shaming you out, it may take years to restore your confidence. And that's what I've seen, or restore your self-worth. Now, self-worth and self-esteem go hand in hand, but they're two separate concepts. And many times people use them in the same, but they're not the same. Self-esteem, self-esteem relates more to your level of confidence. Self-worth is more to your to state of value, how you value yourself. They're closely related, but they're two separate concepts. And if you're constantly made fun of, it affects both self-worth and self-esteem. Many people do not realize how, e how easy it is to be stolen. And some people just give it away without even knowing it because you want to please so much. But one of the biggest ways you give away yourself your, your, your identity is this way, is by lies and also by fear. People like to bring fear to you. Now, one thing about fear that's very powerful, even governments use that, religions use it, traditions use it, Every, even your husband and wife can use it. When they bring fear to you, you begin to change. That's why we say you must learn. We'll get to that in a minute too. But fear is not only used by, by, by someone that's stripping away your identity, but remember it can be used by governments, religions, traditions, even family members. Fear is very powerful. So many people don't realize how, it, how easy it is to, to lose your identity or, or, be, or be stolen from you. It is stolen by lies, deception, and criticism can suffer adverse consequences. It is not often known by the victim that this is happening, but others can see it. For an example, in a, let's say in a domestic violence situation, a woman can see, let's say she's been, she's been abused emotionally, physically, and she can't see it, but other people can see it. Even her own children can see it. But many times it takes years for her to see it. Finally, one day she wakes up and realizes what's really happening. You know what happens? Then she gets mad. She gets mad at herself by saying, why didn't I see this? What's wrong with me? Well, unfortunately, your identity was stolen and you didn't even know it, right? And you, you just gave it away. The other thing here is that when, you, when you're going through a domestic situation, rejection, is a big one, it's a big one. You don't, no one likes to be rejected, particularly by someone you love and admire. Rejection, verbal rejection, and nonverbal rejection have, have similar impact. First of all, they both hurt. They both hurt, okay? One of the biggest reasons why it hurts is because you cannot, you're not able to connect 
you know, you don't have that connection that we all need. We all need to be connected to loved ones, to friends, to community. And some people just don't connect and they feel rejected and it really begins to hurt. And there's a little formula I'll go over to you. I'll go a little, for, a little formula I'll go over with you in a minute. Okay. Family violence and abuse. First of all, we say this. We as an organization strongly condemn family violence and abuse in any form, in any form. Family or domestic violence, this is the key word, is intentional abuse of a family member to impose power and control over another. Now, anger is not necessarily intentional. Let's say, for an example, let's say you got mad because you spilled something on the kitchen table. Well, anger is an emotion. Domestic violence, from our point of view, is that when you intend, I intend to control that person, I intend to dominate them, now you're getting over to, you're getting over to domestic violence when you intend to do it. So we'd like to stress the word, it's, in, it's an intentional abuse of a family member to impose power and control over another. Now this is another big important point you need to understand. Violence is a people problem, not a gender specific problem. Some people think it's only a male's problem, man. It is not a man's problem. It is not a woman's problem. It's a people problem. Even children can impose value, can impose, uh, can, can be violent to their own parents or to their grandparents. So it's not an age specific, it's not a gender specific, it's a people problem. And that's how we teach it in this program. Any type of relationship can become abusive. You can be madly in love and start a relationship may start wonderful, but any relationship can become abusive if we're not careful, careful. Because when emotions are left unchecked, people can hurt others. Some people just keep, keep like, kind, of, kind of like a pressure cooker sometimes. They get hurt and they just keep it inside. They don't, they don't share it. And it builds up, builds up, and boom, it explodes. Okay? So I'm saying here that people can hurt others verbally, emotionally, sexually, or physically. Okay? And you may want to look at some of your clients have looked at. How are they being abused verbally, emotionally, sexually, or physically? And some may experience two of them, three of them, or all of them. And so it really impacts someone. So these are just some ways you want to, uh, okay. Now we're, now we're going to talk about the abuser. One thing about the abuser is this. They like to condemn truth. They put truth to the side because the truth is their worst enemy. They don't like it. So an abuser likes to condemn truth. The other thing about an abuser is this. Had they have no confidence in you. They really don't. They, and they, that's why they abuse you, because they have no confidence in you. They create equality, inequality through unfair rules. They make rules that are not fair. They take advantage of that. They take advantage of you because of the victim because with unfair rules. I can do it, but you can't do it, okay? They they're, will endlessly lie and cheat you. I've worked with couples in the past and say, you know, if a person continuously, the key word is continuously, if they continuously lie to you, create unfair rules and cheat you, you know what? They don't have, they have no respect or love for you or the relationship. But yet people still hang on to that for year after year after year. The abuser loves wrong and they love bad things. They really do. The abuser does not understand love at all. They don't understand love. They know what they know, they know the word love. They know that love will get them. If they say, I love you, that will warm people up sometimes. They and they confuse love with sex. They control, they confuse love with pleasure. Love is something different. We, we have a whole section on that, too, in our program. Okay, the abuser becomes a stranger to the family. He, be, he becomes a stranger to them, to the family, and they become a stranger to him. They don't, or to them. They don't really know each other. They think they do. They could live in the same house, under the same roof, but they don't know each other. The abuser does not know good from evil. They really don't. 
They try to make good look bad and make bad look good to cover their own tracks. So they don't know good from evil. That's my experience. The abuser will steal and lie to feed their selfish ambition. Most abusers are very selfish. That's a big default in the people that are abusers. Remember, it can be a male or a female, a young or old. So they will steal a lie to feed their selfish ambitions. Now let's look at the word power and control here. Power and control can be associated with these things. Employment, finances, education, status or position, skills like technical skills, communicational skills, interpersonal skills, or family structure. Now, let's look at violence. It's based upon, it's based upon power and control. Let's ask the question, who in the family has more power and control? Who is the aggressor? Who is afraid of whom? Now let's look at this. Let's say the husband and wife, who is more employable? Is it the man or the woman? The husband or the wife? Who makes more money? The man or the woman? Who's better educated? The man or the woman? The husband or the wife? Who has a better status in the family, position or community? The man or the woman? The husband or the wife? Who has better technical skills? Typing, computer skills, communication skills, verbal skills. Who has better interpersonal skills, can talk to strangers easier? What's the family structure about? So you can see sometimes power and control is associated with things such as employment, finance, education, status, position, skills, technical, communication, personal, and family structure. Remember, ask these questions. Who in the family has more power and control? Who is the aggressor? And who is afraid of who? And it's not always the male. It could be a female. It could be young and old. I mean, when we, if we had a group, we would really discuss these, but we don't have the time. How much time do I have? Um, about 20 minutes. Oh, I'm, I'm get it. A tyrant. What's a tyrant? Someone who brutally and harshly uses power and authority to oppress others. Oppress. You push people down. You hold them back. That's what oppression is. You keep them down and you hold them back. Tyrants controlled by power or any means available. Some men or women are tyrants in their own home. Through this behavior, a personal choice is taken away. They make all the choices for you. They make all the decisions for you. The right to choose is an important, valuable belief that runs deeply through Native American cultures. That's one of the beauties of our culture. We want you to be able to make your own choices. Why? Because choice. You have to make your own choices. Why? Because choice is necessary for us to progress as a people, a progress as an individual, we must be given the right to make our own choices. And tyrants many times take that away from us. And remember, it could be a government, it could be a religion, it could be traditions, it could be even your own spouse, your father and mother. So remember, choice, you say choice is the only thing you really, really own. You don't even own your, you could be, we could all be, be dead next week. A choice is something you will have even after death. You'll have the right to choose. Value it, protect it, treasure it. That's the only thing you really, really own is the right to choose. Now, without freedom of choice, this is what happens. If choice is taken away from you, you want our parents to understand this. You will never know true happiness. If someone's always making decisions for you, you will never grow and develop. You become dependent upon others. Your hand is always out. Help me, help me. Give me, give me, give me. You will limit or lose opportunities in life. You will lose confidence and the ability to act or make your own choices. You want someone to make choices for you. You become a victim of power, manipulation, and control. Let me give an experience, an example. One time I had a father that was just released from prison and in prison, the system tells you what to do, where to, where to sleep, what to wear, where to eat, what to eat, everything. Then you have another system called gangs. They tell you what to do, to what kind of, 
if you're going to put a tat, what kind of tat you can put on, everything. For an example, let's say you're, half, you're part Native American and part Caucasian. Well, in prison, you can't be a white guy one day and the next day Native American. You can't do that. You got to make up your mind. So the system tells you what to do and the gangs tell you what to do. Your choice is basically taken away from you. Well, I had a father that was in prison for a number of years and he came out. And he said, Al, he, I mean, he gave me a call. And I says, let's go have some lunch. And he says, okay. And I said, where do you want to go? He was just out the day before. He said, I don't care. Any place you want to, any place you want to go, Al, any place. Said, no, no, you tell me you've been in prison. Let me tell you, I'll take you where you want to go. No, Al, you, you go where, I'll just go with you. Okay. So I love, people know, know me, I love greasy fried chicken. Okay. I said to him, I says, you want to go eat some chicken? He says, yeah, fried chicken. So I took him to Popeye's chicken. And as we're, and as we're eating chicken, he says, you know, Al, this is the third meal I've had in a row where I've had fried chicken. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me we could have gone at a pizza or a hamburger or whatever you wanted? But he, he was so used to everybody telling him what to do, it was hard for him to make his own choice. So I'm saying, if you've been a victim, it's hard to make your own choices. We work with our people to value the right to make their own choice. Because again, you will never know true happiness. We want you to be happy. The pursuit of happiness. Now, this is just me from my experience as a practitioner, as a therapist. I don't like to say people are sick or they're broken. I don't like to say that. I say most of the problems people have, of my experience is this. Most people have been hurt. And they've been hurt by people that are really insignificant in their lives, like their parents, their siblings, or their spouses. They've been hurt. And if you don't take care of that hurt, you carry that with you. And if you're not careful, that hurt can quickly turn to anger. Okay? And if you're not careful, if you don't take care of that anger, it can turn to resentment. You begin to resent certain things. You even begin to resent yourself. And then if you're not careful, it turns to hatred and revenge. The last step is evil. What evil is, is a continuous mindset of how can I destroy you? How can I bring you down? And let me give you a little example of that. Let's say somebody tells you for years, I love you, I care about you. And let's say you're in the parking lot at Walmart coming out of the store. And you go up to your car, you're gonna put something in the back of your car. And somebody comes, a, a person comes by and pushes you down and starts hitting you and kicking you and you're on the ground and you're saying to this person, and you look at the person that's always telling you they, they love you. You look at that person, you say, help me, help me. And they just stand there and look at you. And then you're all beat up and this person leaves, you're all bloody. And then the person that says, I love you all the time, they say, are you okay? You're gonna get that hurt while you're laying, while you're laying, they're getting beat up, you're hurt. Why aren't you helping me? Why aren't you, I'm calling for help, why aren't you helping me? And then after the person leaves, like I said, and the person says, are you okay? That hurt quickly turns to anger. Why didn't you help me? You always tell me that you love me. Why didn't you help me? And if you don't take care of that, it turns to resentment. She may, they may say, can I help you get up? Don't touch me. Leave me alone. Get out of my face. And if you don't take care of that, resentment turns to hatred and revenge. I'm going to get you someday. And if you're not careful, that mindset turns into evil. I'm constantly myself. We have a we have a process we go through saying, but I say most people are not sick. Now, modern day th people want you to think they're sick. No, because when they make you, when they, when they tell you that you're sick, you become dependent on them. I'm sick and tired of Native Americans being, being dependent on everybody. You, I, you, you can be dependent on yourself. Our problem is that we've been hurt and we can overcome that. That's why I work on self-worth, identity, and purpose. Okay. Dangers of rebellion. I say this again. We talk about rebellion. There are three different stages of rebellion, I say. One of them is called simple rebellion. You're starting to test the rules. I don't want to do the dishes. I did them last night. You begin to test the system. Everybody goes through that. Simple rebellion. Next level of rebellion we talk about is a willful rebellion. 
you will be, you knowingly going against the rules, <clears throat> okay? And, and that's you begin to willfully rebel against rules, okay? The last category is open rebellion. You don't care about the rules at all. You don't care who you hurt, who you see. And let me give another example about that. I was teaching a class on one of the native reservations a few years ago, and we went to break for lunch. And this woman, we came back from lunch, this woman was very upset. And I said, what's wrong? She said, oh, I, I was going home for lunch and I saw my husband, he was drunk. He's walking down the street and he saw me coming. He recognized my, our truck and he saw me and he, so he jumped in the ditch so I wouldn't see him. I said, what did you do? She says, I just let him stay in the ditch. I just kept on going, I was so mad. And then and she said, I'm so mad. And another woman says, I wish my husband still jumped in the ditch. She says, my husband, he doesn't care who sees him drunk. He doesn't care what he does. She says, let me tell you what he did last week. My little, one of our kids, I have a, I have a daughter that was in uh, elementary school. And our, my husband, their father went to the school and he was drunk drinking. But he had to go to the bathroom he went to the bathroom in his britches and he took his waist out of his pants and he started spreading it all over the, uh, all over the walls of the outside of the building. He didn't care who saw him. He didn't care who he shamed out. He was just open rebellion because he didn't get what he wanted. Simple rebellion, willful rebellion, and open rebellion. When you get to open rebellion, it's a whole different ballgame. Would love to show you what I mean by that, but we don't have time for that. It's, it's, even, it's very scary, okay? Family violence, imagine an iceberg. The tip of the iceberg we, we, that we see is above the water, which represents the violence that is reported. You get the reports of the police department or hospitals, but, but the iceberg below the water surface represents the violence that we do not see that is not addressed. And that's where most of the problems are, is under the water, unreported issues that have not come up. So. I want you to look at the family violence as like an iceberg. We only see the tip of the iceberg. We don't really see what's below the iceberg, but that's where the violence really takes. That's why we want people to become strong, understand their, uh, their self-worth, their identity and purpose. They will begin to fix themselves. It's happened time and time again in our program. 10 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes, I'm sorry, okay. Um, I talk too much. Major factors contributing to family violence, modeling, of violence and control in childhood. You, you see this as a child. You're not born, it's not in your DNA. You see it, you learn it. Low self-esteem linked to self-confidence, low self-worth linked to self-respect. Apathy, the lack of feeling of concern, emotion or interest. Lack of self-control, emotional control. The emotion is the con controls the person rather than the person controlling their emotions. And we work a lot on that, controlling your own emotions. Limited coping skills, unwilling and unable to solve problems, respectful and nonviolent. My time's going to be. Choice. That's what we see. Next to life itself, the greatest possession you have is the right to choose. Choice, freedom to act for yourself. This is how we develop, this is how we define self-respect. The right to make your own choices. If you have self-respect, you give yourself the right to make your own choices. If you respect other people, you allow them the same opportunity to make their own choices. When there is violence, choice has been taken away. Simple as that. Your greatest possession. Person, these are some things that create it. Personal pride. How many, 10 minutes you said? Yeah. I, got, I probably got to go really fast because these are some of the things that create a tyrant, you might want to say. Personal pride. They, they find it difficult to accept authority and prone to rebellion. I can just, you just can go through these real quick. Another one, personal pride is selfish. Selfishness, people are selfish, create self-centeredness, self-importance, self-pity, self-fulfillment, self-gratification, the lack of understanding in a relationship, the lack of tolerance. That's what a selfish person does. And you know what? We say the biggest reason for divorce, you know what that is? Selfishness. That's the biggest reason for divorce. Think about it. Criticism, harsh and unfair, puts others down, shames them out, holds others back refuses to accept rules, causes others to be feel left out, finds fault with or making fun of other people. Defensive, they become argumentative, threaten others, 
unwilling to draw close to others or solve problems. Why many times? Because they are the problem. Control judges attacks individuals instead of the problem. Does not look at the whole picture, only their point of view. Okay, and that's a, a person that's very defensive many times. They don't. They they never like to look at the problem because most of the time they are the problems themselves. Now maybe I can skip this because the Indians, Native people, rarely get jealous. But in case there's some jealous one on your reservation someplace, jealousy is stressful, suspicious, possessive. Again, in a relationship, you do not possess anybody, and no one possesses you. You're not somebody's property, and no one is your. You don't belong to anybody. Jealous person becomes close-minded. They hold grudges for years. Oh my goodness. They want to get even. They want to like to bring fear to other people. They believe rumors, gossip, and lies. They love those. See things that are not really true or factual. They want to control, they want to control the other person or situation. These are some of the things. Jealousy is rampant all over the place, except Indian country, excuse me. Lying and deception, lying and deception. Remember I said lying will close your mind and close your heart. Lying will condemn truth. They will listen to and believe lies. They'll speak badly about others. Does not keep promises. Hides hate and anger with lies. Turns backs on loved ones. Willfully and knowingly destroys others. Does not know how to love. This is important. A person that lies does not know how to love. They really don't. And I wish I could spend time with you and showing what I mean by it, explaining that really carefully. They pretend to be spiritual or religious. Some of the biggest liars get up there and they preach and all that kind of stuff. I could tell you stories you would not believe. Pretend to be spiritual or religious. They live a double life. Lying deception. Anger. Now it defines anger as an addiction. That's how we define anger. Okay. Anger, that continuous anger. Okay. Loses control. Loses Loss of emotions. No one can make you angry unless you let them. Most problems today are that involve violence are linked to anger. Anger does not solve anything, builds nothing, but can destroy everything. Anger leads to hatred, revenge, and injustice. I gotta go pretty fast, people. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's we got more time. Okay. Now we want you to learn. One of the principles we teach in our program is teachable. Are you teachable? Now that doesn't mean going to college. It's good to go to college, go to school, get an education. But are you teachable? We want you to be able to do. Teachable means can you find the truth? Teachable is that you embrace truth. Because when you embrace truth, guess what? You're not easily fooled. You're not easily fooled. You become a master of yourself. And when we work with people, we want, to be, we want you to become a master of yourself. And these are the ways you do it. You must first have a desire to find the truth, even about yourself. Can you recognize truth? Can you accept it? Can you communicate it? Can you show it or can you live it? You do those five things and I promise you, you will become a master of yourself. And there's a process to this, there's a process to it. And so you don't have time to go over it, but the, we want you to learn the truth. Are you teachable? For an example, if you were taught two and two equals five, you'll never be a good mathematician. You must learn the truth of mathematics. Two and two equals four doesn't equal five. Okay, so again, if you learn, if you believe two and two equals five, you'll never be a banker. You'll never be an accountant. You'll never be able to balance your own checkbook. You can't do it. So you must learn the truth of mathematics. You must learn the truth of your partners, of your employers. Okay of yourself even. Now what we do with our people is this. We want them to become forward moving people. We want us, our clients to become forward moving. That's how you do it. You first become a forward thinking person. You put good things into your mind that will motivate and inspire you to do good. And we help you do that. Number two, you become a forward looking person. You see past your own problems and imperfection and recognize the value, your value and your potential. That's forward looking. Forward moving is letting go of experiences and bad memories that hold you down and back. 
okay? We don't, we don't expect you to forget them, but we don't expect you to hold that. We don't want you to hold you back and down. So we want you to come forward thinking, forward moving, and a for, forward looking, and a forward moving. We must be a forward moving people. So you're done? Okay, I got one, two more slides, and then I'm done. He'll come back on and ask questions. Okay. I say this. I know of no Native American tradition, belief, ceremony, teaching that allows family members to abandon, abuse, neglect, ignore, harm, injure, or molest other family members, specifically children. If you know one of those, please let me know and I'll change this quote. The natural order of our Native ways is to help one another, to watch over one another, and to comfort one another. That's the real Native way. And you start with your spouse and your family. There is nothing, and I mean there is nothing more important and precious than your family. Thank you. Hey, Al, thank you very much for that great presentation. I have a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind uh, sure. giving us a minute of your time. Um, the first one is from Joyce Gibbons, and she asked, what is the best medicine or help for the abuser? Oh, that's a good one. <clears throat> what I do with some of my people who come who are the abusers, remember I start with their self-worth. They really need to know their own value. They need, and I give my men assignments. People that come out of prison, I say to them, I, I talk with them for a while, but I say to them, do you really want to change? And they say, yes, that's, a, that's the normal response. Well, that's okay, if you really want to change, I say, do you like to be in control of yourself? Do you like to be in control? Oh yeah, I like to be in control, okay. This is your assignment for the next week. This is your assignment. And I said, I'm gonna check on you. And I will check on you. I said, I want you to do something that's really Native American. I want you to be kind to all of mankind, everyone, all colors, shapes, sizes, whatever. You are, you are Native American. I'm helping them identify who they are. You are Native American. You be kind to everyone. That's your job, but this is where you start. You start by being kind to your dear, dear spouse. That's where you start. And your family. And I say, I'm going to check up on you. You know what? I say, you start there because now you are in control. You just told me you want to be in control. So let's put you in control. You are nice and kind to everyone. You know what? It begins to work. People begin to do that because they know I'm going to check up on them. And because they're Native American. And I have a lot of one other things, but that's just one of the things that I do. I hope that's helpful. Great. Thank you. And the second question we have is also from Joyce, and she asked, is forward moving the same as forgiveness? Okay. Good, good question. Forgiveness, yes, that's part of forward moving. Because you know what? When you forgive, oh, that is so powerful. That's a really important part of healing. And I have a whole presentation on healing. I'd love to talk about the healing itself but we don't have time. But I have a whole presentation I can talk about healing. But yes, healing is critical. Forgiveness is critical. When you, but there's two, there's two people you gotta forgive and heal, forgive. You gotta learn to forgive yourself also and to forgive other people that have hurt you. When you forgive, you know what happens? You are now have transformed yourself. You're not the same person, you're a different person. You come out and the benefits of healing, forgiving is this. You come out with a clear conscience, and a clear mind. You're a transformed person. And that is very, very possible. You just have to learn how to do it. I'd love to show you how to do it. Hope that answers the question. No other question? Uh, yeah, I have one other question here. Um, so in terms of you said that, uh, you know, you have these other seminars and other talks that, that would be helpful for people. What is a good resource for um, the participants to learn more about these programs? Well, when better start, go to our website. <clears throat> Don't contact me because I'm not too good at that. Contact our office. We have a whole list of workshops we can do. Oh, 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 oh yeah. Right there. There's a contact information right there. And ask for... You can talk to Amy, she's the executive director. And then uh, I, just, I just write the material, I just teach it, okay? My staff does everything else, okay? I don't even buy my own clothes, my wife buys all my clothes. If you don't like the way I dress, don't, don't get mad at me. 
Um, so contact us. We can do trainings. We can do seminars. We can do whatever we want, workshops. And uh, yes, I've done that all over the country. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to thank you very much, Al, from behalf of everyone at NICWA for taking time to give this information and, and presentation to our members. It's very valued. Um, so thank you. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. And thank you again. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.